Hi, my name is John Cocaine. I'm a postdoc at the Alan Turing Institute and I'm going to present my talk on Bayesian probabilistic numerical methods in integration. Um, and I'd like to start by saying a huge thank you to the organisers who, in spite of the unusual situation that we found ourselves in, have gone ahead with organising uh, this online conference, which I've uh, very much enjoyed so far. So I should start by giving proper credit to some of my collaborators for this work. Um, so these are those people. Uh, there's Chris Oates, who's a professor at Newcastle University, Tim Sullivan, who's a professor at Warwick, Mark, uh, who's a professor at Cambridge, and FX Briol, uh, who's a professor at UCL. So I should start as well by saying that this talk is going to be relatively introductory in nature. So if you're already familiar with Bayesian quadrature or probabilistic numerical methods, um, then you might want to just skip ahead to the other talks in this mini symposium. But that being said, this is what the outline of this talk will be. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing Bayesian probabilistic numerical methods, uh, because I'm sure a lot of people haven't heard of, of these kinds of methods before and don't know what they are. Then I'll introduce by way of uh, in an example, a simple Bayesian probabilistic numerical method that's just for solving uh, finite dimensional linear systems. Um, so outside of the complexity of the integration problem that we're going to be considering in part three, when I'll talk about uh, a, the, the canonical Bayesian probabilistic numerical method for integration, uh, which is also called Bayesian quadrature, um, and then I'll conclude. So as I said, I'll start by talking about Bayesian probabilistic numerical methods. Um, so the core conceit behind probabilistic numerical methods is that numerical problems can be phrased as inference problems and tackled using statistical techniques, whereas usually we would tackle them using, uh, well, classical numerical methods. So to give an example of, of how we might do that, here's a prototypical problem, which is not an integration problem, unfortunately, but I'm sure it's a problem that many of you will be familiar with nevertheless. So this is an ordinary differential equation. Uh, I've omitted any initial conditions which we might require, well, which we would require to solve this ODE uh, usually, um, but never, I mean, this is just for uh, a, a toy problem for motivation. So how would we solve this usually? Well, there's a, a plethora of ODE solvers like runge kutter methods or Adams-Bashforth or so, and so on, uh, which are out there. Um, but let's pretend that we didn't know about those and think about how we might set this up from a statistical perspective. Um, so what do we have here? We've got a function on the right hand side f of x. This is a function that we can evaluate anywhere inside its domain. Um, so we can think of it as a source of finite information. So if I choose a point xi inside the domain uh, or a set of points xi inside the domain and I evaluate my f uh, at those points and because I've assumed that f here is independent of u, um, that gives me some information which I could use to try and recover u of x. Uh, on the left hand side, there's my u of x, which is an unknown to be computed. Um, and if I look at the whole uh, equation that I've got here, this gives me a relationship between the two. So a relationship between my source of information, uh, which I can uh, evaluate uh, to produce finite information, and my unknown to be computed. So if we think about how this might look in statistical language, uh, it, we see that it's very similar. We have a source of uh, finite information or data. Uh, we have an unknown, uh, and in the Bayesian framework, what we might think to do is place a prior on that unknown. And then we have this equation that relates the source of data and the unknown, which is often called the forward model in Bayesian inverse problems, uh, or the likelihood model, uh, the, the data generating procedure, all of these words. So if we have those three ingredients, then we can apply standard Bayesian um, ideas, or not quite standard, but uh, almost standard Bayesian ideas, to define the posterior distribution of u of x, which forms the output of a, a Bayesian conditioning problem. But there's a fundamental difference between these kinds of problems and uh, classical Bayesian inference problems, in that whereas in both classical Bayesian inference, inference problems and um, this problem, we have uh, the ingredients which are a source of finite information and an unknown and a forward model, which at the bottom here I've abstracted behind this operator uh, calligraphic G, which is often called a parameter to observation map. In a normal Bayesian inversion problem or Bayesian inference problem, the observations that we were able to obtain of the right hand side would be corrupted by noise, which here I've um, denoted Xi. Whereas in our um, Bayesian inference problem, the observations that we obtain are noiseless. If I uh, evaluate 
my f at any point inside the domain, then ignoring things like uh, numerical um, precision in, inside a computer, that observation, that evaluation of f of x that I obtained would be exact, uncorrupted by noise. But nevertheless, uh, while that uh, noise uh, is one of the reasons, one of the motivations for uh, placing a prior on u of x um, and uh, inverting the problem to produce a posterior, um, we have a second source of uncertainty, which is that we can only evaluate f of x at finitely many locations. So the system is always going to be underdetermined, no matter how many times we take evaluations of f because uh, f is, an, is generally speaking an infinite dimensional quantity and so we can't recover u from finitely many observations of it. So just to sort of summarize that, Bayesian probabilistic numerical methods are Bayesian inverse problems, <coughs> a particular class of those problems in which we don't have noisy information and that leads to some extra um, technical considerations which I'm not going to go into in this talk um, around how we define the posterior distribution but nevertheless, apart from that subtlety, um, the methodology that we could apply to these problems is essentially the same. And an important question to ask is why we should think about doing this. So um, why take uh, what otherwise looks like a straightforward numerical problem and inject uncertainty into it by following a Bayesian methodology? Um, and this is one of the motivations that I like to use. Other motivations are available. Um, but uh, the motivation that has inspired a lot of my work is the idea of using these uh, Bayesian probabilistic numerical methods within uh, inverse problems, within classical noisy inverse problems, to account for the fact that often in those inverse problems we're unable to evaluate the forward map exactly, uh, and instead we have to resort to numerical approximations of it. So it's been shown that if you do this and you use a forward solver, that a numerical forward solver that's inaccurate, then what you can obtain are biased and overconfident inferences, um, which is pretty much the worst thing that you can have uh, as a solution or an approximate solution to a Bayesian inference problem, because that means that you're pretty certain about the wrong answer. And this cartoon here that I've got at the top illustrates this. I've got three possible um, posterior distributions over the solution to a, a Bayesian inference problem. Um, so this is just a one-dimensional Bayesian inference problem where the true value of the parameter is just this value here, zero. Um, if we had an oracle solver, so if we could exactly evaluate our forward map for any given value of the parameter, then this is the posterior that we would obtain, this sort of Gaussian looking curve centered on the true value of the parameter, but widened to account for the fact that we have finitely many observations and um, for the fact that those observations may be noisy. If we, instead of using this oracle forward solver, we use a discretized forward map, and the discretization of that forward map is um, not particularly accurate, the forward solver uh, has a high degree of error, then this is the pos a, a posterior that we might obtain. And this is just a cartoon, but we might obtain a posterior that was shifted, but very confident about uh, its shifted answer. So you can see the support of the posterior distribution, or rather the area where it places most of its probability mass barely overlaps with uh, the support of the uh, Oracle solver. Now the idea is if we use a probabilistic numerical method to solve the forward problem, then we have not only an estimate of the solution, which might be given by the posterior mean or might be given by a sample from the posterior distribution from the probabilistic numerical method. We also have a, a, a variance, a width, or, or a um, distribution over possible values uh, that are equally or, or similarly likely um, given the finite information that we've observed. So as a result, we can use that uncertainty and incorporate it in a statistically rigorous way uh, into the likelihood which we use within the inference problem, the Bayesian inference problem, uh, to widen our posterior inferences to account for how certain we are about the solution to the forward problem. And that's exactly what you see with this green line here. We have uh, inferences, a posterior distribution over the parameter, which is still shifted, it's still biased, nothing about the Bayesian probabilistic numerical methods paradigm is going to affect that, um, but the width of the distribution is, is increased so that we have more support where the oracle, uh, where the true oracle-based posterior distribution would lie. So in other words, we're still biased, we still have a shifted posterior distribution as a result of not having solved the forward problem exactly, but we're no longer overconfident about that incorrect answer, which is a much more tolerable situation for a Bayesian statistician. 
So now to um, give a more concrete set of examples, I'm going to talk briefly about Bayesian probabilistic numerical methods for linear systems. So here is a prototypical linear system. We have uh, AX star equals B. Um, I'm sure this is a problem that most of you have, have seen many times before. A is a given D by D matrix, which we assume to be invertible, and X star and B are each uh, D-dimensional vectors. B is, the, uh, is given here, so this is the right-hand side, the analog of F of X in our ODE example, and X, uh, this should be an X star here, sorry, is the unknown to be recovered. And despite the fact that um, of course, since A is invertible, we can always recover the solution to this uh, system in finite time. Uh, that finite time may nevertheless be very large or may require an impractical amount of memory. Um, and so as a result, there's an interest in solvers for these kinds of systems that use less CPU time and less memory, um, but produce an inaccurate solution, which uh, hopefully we can find a way to uh, put a probability measure over with Bayesian probabilistic numerical methods. Um, to allow us to use that less accurate solution um, in, for example, Bayesian inference problems uh, and still be able to trust um, that the solution to those Bayesian inf inference problems uh, is statistically robust. So let's look at how we would construct a PN solver for this um, problem. So we consider a set of search directions, S1 up to Sm. These are uh, S1 to Sm are d-dimensional vectors uh, and we have n, m of them. So Sm is a d by m matrix. Um, so in order to construct the probabilistic numerical method, we need three ingredients. We need an information operator. So here is our information operator for this problem. A of X star um, is given by transposing our system, which we saw on the previous slide here, um, against that set of search directions uh, to obtain the information YM, which is of course computable because we know these SM and we know B. Uh, we need a prior. Um, so in this case, um, my prior is going to be Gaussian with mean x0 and covariance sigma0 and this is a very common theme in um, probabilistic numerical methods that will use Gaussian priors because they're very uh, tractable and easy to compute with. Um, and uh, the third ingredient that we need is of course how to, con how to sample from or uh, in this case obtain explicitly our posterior distribution. Um, so because I've got a Gaussian prior and because my information here is linear, um, my posterior distribution can be obtained in closed form and it's Gaussian with mean XM and covariance sigma M, uh, where XM and sigma have M have these very well-known forms. Um, so I'm not going to belabor these too much because the form uh, of the posterior distribution isn't particularly important. Um, but what is important is that there is a closed form and this uh, posterior covariance can be used uh, as an error indicator. So uh, it provides a description of uh, how much uncertainty is left uh, if we were to interpret XM as a point estimator of the truth X star. So that's what I've just said. We can interpret the posterior mean as an estimate of the solution or in the nomenclature of um, iterative methods for solving these kinds of systems, the iterate. Uh, and the posterior covariance uh, can be viewed as an error estimator, which is supposed to describe how far away the truth is or the iterate is from the truth. So there are many existing uh, Bayesian probabilistic numerical methods for solving this problem. And broadly speaking, they split into two categories. So I'm just supplying some references here uh, for the sake of interest if anybody wants to uh, examine these methods further. So I um, and collaborators have followed what we call the solution-based view, where we place a prior on the solution X star um, and attempt to obtain a posterior of the solution. There's also the matrix-based view, which uh, has been um, followed mostly by a group out of Tübingen, uh, in which instead we place a prior on the inverse of the matrix and attempt to um, construct a posterior. Um, and uh, a comparison between the two is was conducted uh, in this paper by Simon Bartels uh, and co-authors uh, last year. And I should point out this hot off the presses paper from Tim Reed, uh, which has just appeared on archive in the last few days. So that's um, hopefully gives you an idea of how probabilistic numerics typically goes, particularly in linear problems. We obtain, we seek to obtain linear information about the solution. In this case, it was obtained by transposing the solution against a set of search directions. Um, and uh, then we exploit conjugacy of Gaussian priors with that linear information to obtain a posterior distribution in closed form. 
And basically the important property to note here is that the same conjugacy properties hold in function spaces. We just have to substitute Gaussian distributions for what are commonly known as Gaussian processes. Um, but the caveat is that we need to be more careful about the information. So whereas we're relatively free in what choice of linear information we can choose, and in fact, we can choose any set of linear functionals of the solution to construct our posterior, provided that set of linear functionals are linearly independent. In function spaces, things are a little bit more challenging just because um, arbitrary linear functionals uh, can be difficult to compute. In particular, uh, if we think of an arbitrary linear functional, say in L2, um, then uh, these are represented uh, by um, inner products with vectors in L2 by Riesz representation. Um, and computing those inner products amounts to computing an integral. So in an integration problem, that can be just as challenging as the problem that we were originally trying to solve. So we need to be slightly more careful about the choice of information that we make, but nevertheless, um, provided we can find a choice of linear information, uh, the posterior has a closed form. That leads me on to uh, this uh, last section of the talk, BPNM for integration. Um, so here's the problem that we're trying to solve now. We have an unknown function u, which is assumed to be continuous and square integrable, and pi some distribution on d. And our goal is to compute pi of u, which is defined to be the integral of this function u of x against um, pi, the distribution uh, that we want to um, integrate against. So how do we construct a probabilistic numerical method here? Well, the setup is slightly different to the setup in the linear system case in that there's an extra ingredient, um, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, but the basic setup that we take is we perform inference on u of x rather than on pi of u directly. And then we project it through what we call a q of i oper q o i operator, which is this pi c dot here. So we infer the function itself using some using a essentially Gaussian process regression. Um, and then we project the regressor through the integration operator, which is linear, to obtain a posterior distribution. So to use the uh, terminology that we used on one of the previous slides, um, this is the information operator that we end up using. So we have AMU, which is obtained um, by uh, choosing um, points inside the domain x1 to xm and just evaluating u at those points to obtain our information ym. And this is what I meant on one of the other slides on, a, a few moments ago when I said that we had to be a little bit more careful about the information that we use because this kind of information where we evaluate the function at fixed locations turns out to be, well, obviously is uh, computable with Gaussian priors whereas arbitrary linear functionals might not be. So for our prior, um, as I said, we use a Gaussian prior, um, same notation as before, except for that whereas in the previous slide, this was just a multivariate Gaussian distribution, now it's a Gaussian process with a covariance operator C or equivalently a covariance kernel K, and it turns out to be more convenient to work with covariance kernels um, for these problems. And then if we uh, introduce some notation, so I let K of X with this set capital XM, uh, be this vector here of uh, kernel evaluations um, and k of capital xm be this matrix of kernel evaluations so the Gramian matrix formed by the kernel and all pairwise combinations of uh, d times d then our posterior over u can straightforwardly express be expressed in this form um, so I should note that I'm as, I've assumed a centered Gaussian prior here this is all uh, almost identical with an uncentered Gaussian prior um, but just for simplicity of notation, I've assumed that the prior is centered. Um, and the form of the posterior distribution is essentially, again, identical to the form uh, in the linear system case, but instead of, uh, but, but because of the particular choice of information that we've used, now we don't have intermediate matrices on all of these matrices here. We just have um, the uh, matrix of kernel evaluations. But nevertheless, this is just linear algebra and provides us with our um, posterior distribution over the uh, unknown function u. But how do we get our um, posterior over the integral? Well, that's straightforward as well. As I've said, we just project the regressor through the integration operator, um, which is exactly what we do here. So um, we, uh, because we're integrating over x, um, the integration operator affects uh, u of x here. Um, and so we obtain what's known as the uh, kernel embedding, um, which is uh, obtained by just computing the integral of k 
um, through uh, pi with respect to its first argument. And then for the posterior covariance, um, we do exactly the same thing. Uh, but because um, it's a posterior covariance, we end up having to apply both the, um, the uh, integration operator and its adjoint, um, which uh, in the case in this case, um, the adjoint uh, or applying the adjoint to the covariance kernel is equivalent to just integrating against the second argument. So that's that's of the kernel. So that's what we've done here. So again, provided that uh, one can compute these kinds of um, kernel embeddings, uh, i.e. we can compute the integral of the kernel um, against uh, certain distributions, then these two quantities are available in closed form. And we have an estimate of the value of the integral given by this guy u bar m, which now will just be a scalar, uh, assuming, well, yeah, will just be a scalar. And we also have k bar m, which can be thought of as an estimate of the uncertainty in that scalar. So this is a schematic of the procedure, um, which is perhaps overly belaboring the point, but this is fundamentally what we do. Um, at the top here, we've got what was at the top on this slide. Uh, so the regression view where we're, um, these dots are our um, locations that we're, are points at which we're evaluating the unknown function, which is the red line here. So this red line is U of X and the blue solid line is the posterior mean of the Gaussian process after um, after conditioning on the evaluation of the function at those points, and we can see that it passes through those points. And as we increase the number of points, uh, the posterior mean tends towards the truth. Um, and furthermore, these dashed lines, which are the posterior, um, posterior credible intervals, also contract on the true value of the function. And then at the bottom here, I've got um, uh, the same thing, but projected through the integration operator. And again, we can see similar behavior. So we have um, initially a very wide posterior distribution, which slowly contracts as the amount of information increases and towards this dashed line, which is the true value of the integral, uh, if we were able to compute it explicitly. So a couple of remarks are in order, which um, might help for later talks in the session. First, the posterior mean is a quadrature rule, uh, by which I mean that it's just a weighted sum of um, evaluations u of xi. Um, and the weights are just given by solving this linear system. So uh, if we go back to this equation here and squint at it, uh, so if we transport, transpose this first part, we obtain precisely this thing here. Um, so in order to solve the weights, in other words, we need to compute, uh, compute the inverse of this matrix and apply it to this vector, uh, which is typically a cubic operation. Uh, or near cubic operation in terms of computational complexity as a function of uh, the number of points m. Um, so that can be quite expensive compared to classical quadrature rules. Um, the significance of the weights w and uh, also the choice of the points xm will be explored in other toy point talks in this session much more um, comprehensively than I will be able to, to discuss those things. So I'll leave that to the later speakers. Um, and theoretical results concerning the convergence of this guy to the truth um, so u bar m to the truth, uh, depend on the smoothness of u and k. Um, and here are some references which you can consult uh, if you're interested in learning more about that. So last thing uh, is, here's a toy example. Um, so uh, here I've got a u of x, so my unknown integrand is sine of x plus one. Uh, pi, my uh, integration distribution, is Gaussian with mean zero and covariance i. Um, I'm using a Gaussian prior over the unknown solution u of x, um, which is centered, so mean zero, and with this squared exponential kernel, uh, x minus x squared uh, over, two, over l squared, where l is just one, so it's just x of x minus x minus x squared over l, x of minus x minus x squared. Uh, and my points, uh, so my choices of uh, integration evaluation locations um, are obtained by just sampling for them from this distribution pi. Uh, so top line is what we would obtain if we used Monte Carlo sampling. So we just use the Monte Carlo estimator of the value of the integral. And the bottom line here is what we would obtain or what we do obtain if we use BQ with this setup. And we can see that generally the error is lower and we're converging faster. Um, and we have uh, these credible intervals, which um, we can see are kind of, well, they're shrinking as we um, converge, but saying that they're shrinking is, is slightly difficult to see because we're on a log scale on the y-axis, but nevertheless. 
So to conclude, some advantages of Bayesian quadrature, it provides fast empirical convergence and it provides Bayesian uncertainty quantification for the value of the integral. But the downsides are that it has high computational cost and um, because we're inverting a matrix which uh, for various reasons often ends up being um, nearly singular, uh, the um, inversion can be quite numerically unstable. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks in the session. Um, and if anybody has any questions about the talk, then please feel free to uh, let me know by email. Oh, and here are the references.